Gaming Network. I'm here, your host, Will Salas, and I've got Matt Kahn with me here from GamerX, and uh, it's kind of a unique Kickstarter that I had come across last year, and he's back this year, so why don't you go ahead and tell us a little about your project. Hey, Billy. Thanks so much for uh, for having me, and uh, I really appreciate uh, the chance to kind of come on and chat about uh, GamerX. Um, you know, what we're doing is we make a gaming convention uh, here in, in the Bay Area. It's the only uh, public uh, gaming convention in the Bay Area, and we mostly try to focus on providing a safe space for people who um, sometimes feel like other gaming conventions or other, you know, uh, just gaming hangouts um, aren't necessarily always the safest places for uh, LGBT, queer uh, women, people of color. We try to provide a, a, safe, a place that's focused on being a safe space and also talking about uh, issues uh, revolving around diversity and equality in gaming. Okay. Now your convention isn't just uh, video games. It, it's not just. It's kind of encompassing all gaming, right? Yeah, I think that video gaming is kind of our our you know, like I guess kind of our main focus. But you know, we have actually a really large amount of. Um, tabletop and card game um, vendors and people come to play those games. Uh, we have a miniature section. Um, so we have a lot of uh, different things, but I think that it was born out of video games and it kind of became uh, something kind of for all gaming. Okay. So so it's, it's a very welcoming community. Typically, gaming communities or groups tend to be kind of hostile in, in general, sometimes. Not always, uh, uh, but they can be seen generalized as, as being kind of hostile environments or anyone that is is a little bit different or new or, or a woman or or even uh, gay and stuff. So so it's it's kind of interesting that you guys decided to go ahead with this. How how did this this the project kind of come about to to go forward with it as a convention? Um, you know, I, I as a as a gay male growing up. Um, you know, I always I was a huge gamer. I mean, gaming was my you know drug of choice. And um, I always, you know, I dreamed about going to E3. E3 was like my Disney World. And, uh, you know, when I ended up going there, I realized that it wasn't really made for me as a gay male. It was really everything was targeted towards, um, you know, assuming that you were a straight male. And uh, the more I talked to other gay gamers, talked to women gamers, a lot of them felt the same way where they, they loved games. They were gamers at heart. But almost everything involving game, game culture um, didn't include them at all. Um, and so that's kind of the idea that, that you know, behind creating this space is that uh, a lot of people felt the same way, where they wanted to have a space where they could talk about uh, issues that, that, that were important to them. Uh, they, could, they could be in a space where they could talk about, you know, being queer or whatever. And, um, you know, the gaming community has, can, has been and can be at times very xenophobic towards people who are different um, and I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, as gamers and as geeks, we've had to kind of defend ourselves and defend gaming and, and what we do. And I think that now that we've come to become a part of the mainstream, it's very easy for us to say, oh, well, we've gotten ours. Uh, no one else needs, like, we're, we're done fighting. Like, we're happy with where, where it is. And I think it's important that we continue to fight and we continue to make our, our medium even better. And part of that is making it a place where everyone feels welcome and accepted and, want, and you know, welcome as, as a part of the community. Um, and so that's kind of the, the idea behind the convention is, is providing that safe space and uh, showing gay gamers that, you know, there's a thousands of other people just like them and that, you know, they're, they're not alone and that there's, there's, there's plenty of people that, you know, that, that geek out just like them. Yeah, that's really cool. It's really ambitious. Now, you guys this year for your Kickstarter um, have topped... Over your goal, you win about fourteen thousand dollars over your 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 funding goal. Um, were you expecting that? Um, yeah, I, well, you know, so last year we actually raised um, ninety one thousand dollars, and this year is a little bit different because um, with our first year we had done the Kickstarter, and that was our first like, hey, this is what we're doing. Um, and this year was a little bit different in that we actually had been selling tickets. Uh, you know, we had done pre-sale tickets at GamerX One. Uh, we've been selling tickets, and really our Kickstarter this year was more about getting the word out about some of our new celebrity guests, getting, um, you know, just kind of more uh, attention because, uh, you know, last year we got a lot of a lot of both hate and love, and uh, the Kickstarter really helped kind of get us on the map. And 
Um, so that was kind of the reason why we launched it this year. Uh, we raised less than, you know, obviously than we did last year, but uh, I think that a lot, a little bit of the novelty factor is worn off, and, and that's good because, you know, we, we, I want this to be something that is a legitimate, safe, awesome space for gamers, and not just like some like, you know, sideshow. We're like, oh, cool, some gay gamers want their own thing now. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I'm super happy that we hit our goal. I'm super happy that you know we can we can make this happen, and we're gonna be able to have it in a really nice. Um, you know, in one of the nicest hotels in downtown San Francisco, which is certainly not cheap to do. And, um, you know, it's only because people really see this as something that's important into the gaming community and want to support it, which is really awesome. Yeah, that's really cool. And last year you guys peaked at about, what, 2,200, 2,300 attendees? Yep. Um, last year we had about 2,300 attendees. Uh, this year we, uh, the venue is about three times as large. Um, but 2,300 was a little packed, so we're we're gonna be capping our attendance this year at about 4,000 people max. Oh wow! Um, which is still a lot. I mean, it's a lot of people to, to to corral and make sure that they're all having fun. So um, yeah, we, I don't think we could do any more than 4,000. I think that would be a little crazy. Well, growth is always good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. What what kind of, of uh, panelists are you guys getting this year? I know that last year you guys had a lot of people in the in the industry going and, and running panels and stuff. What what kind of panels can people expect this year from from the convention? Um, this year there's definitely going to be a lot of industry panels for sure. I think that um, you know we it's really interesting having people from you know whether they be from games you know reviewers from Gamespot or uh, you know Kotaku or Polygon, whether they be game devs from 2K or Bioware. It's always great to have, you know, people from the industry talking about, um, you know, whether it be, you know, breaking into the industry, dealing with, with issues involving LGBT uh, themes and, and games. But I think also this year, one of one of the the, the um, messages that we had gotten was that a lot of people who came, they weren't interested in getting into the gaming industry. They just were fans of games. And I think that a lot of our panels last year really revolved around getting into the industry, more industry type of things. So this year, I think we're going to do a little bit more fan facing. We're still going to have a lot of educational and and industry type of panels, but uh, we're going to focus a little bit more on on making sure that people who are just you know gamers at heart, they're not working in the gaming industry, but they want to like you know fan out and geek out. Uh, we're going to have a little bit more panels uh, on that end of the spectrum. So, were you expecting this to be more of a like a industry oriented kind of event, or did you kind of? Anticipate it going a little bit more to the fans and be more about the attendees and, and their kind of desire to, to, to just get close to these creators and the people in the industry that they respect? Um, I think originally I had thought it was going to be something where people would really want to um, have like kind of more intellectual dialogues, um, you know, go to panels where they can see industry, you know, titans talk about you know, how they're dealing with like homophobia or transphobia or, you know, how that affects their game design. Uh, but what I learned from GamerX One was that a lot of people uh, went came to GamerX just wanting to be a part of the community. They wanted to come and play games, and play card games, and, and you know video games with other people who were queer like them, and um, you know provided and, and you know, provided a safe space where they could you know um, just just hang out and have fun and geek out. Um, so this year we're going to have a, a much improved game room and a lot more just kind of. You know, things that just for people to just hang out and have fun. I, I think that a lot of people there, I had kind of, I think, miss. I, I love the intellectual and like the, the debates and all that stuff, but I think a lot of people just want to come and relax and have fun, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And, and so this year we're going to make sure that we, you know, make the game rooms even better, and bigger, and, uh, and more curated. Oh, that's cool. And do you guys get any local support? Or do you find yourselves getting any support from any of the the gaming industry, the the, the video gamers, the the companies themselves, or is it just people that work for them, the insiders that are kind of backing you guys up and and giving you the support that you need? Um, it's a little bit of both. I mean, we certainly don't have of uh, the amount of support that we would like from the gaming um from the gaming uh industry, and I think a lot of that just has to do with, you know, uh, LGBT rights in the gaming industry is still sort of new, and it's kind of a novel concept, um, and uh, this is something that, you know, I think for a lot of companies, 
that no one wants to be the first to kind of like stick their neck out there. But you know, last year we had you know panels from Riot Games, Mixed League of Legends, and we had EA and Bioware, uh, NIS America. So we're certainly getting you know um, um, uh, attention and, and support from from larger companies. Um, but you know, we would love to have we would love to be at a point where nearly every AAA publisher at least has some sort of presence, even if it's just doing a panel. Uh, because I mean, I think it's important that that publishers know and let the, let their audience know that uh, they're that you know they 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 want queer gamers to play their games and they support their they support uh, everyone you know playing their games and they, they don't just want to you know target one demographic. They want everyone playing their games and I think ultimately they do. So um, yeah. Okay. What about the tabletop board game industry? Those guys, the miniatures companies, have they provided any support or any volunteers? Have, have they gone? Or are you just having people sign up on their own to do their kind of own demos and their own playthroughs and stuff? Um, yeah. I, I mean, um, you know, we haven't been as as aggressive with targeting, tar- you know, tabletop and miniature and card game companies, but we definitely want to work with um, them as well. Um, I feel like there's not as much of a... Uh, issue in terms of like there's not nearly as much homophobia and transphobia that's kind of present in card and tabletop gaming. There's actually a lot of really awesome uh, games that you know uh, deal with um, queer issues or are very kind of you know different than the norm. And I think that uh, you know part of that is because a board game doesn't cost sixty million dollars to make. Uh, you know people can make much can be much more uh, not riskier, but they can they can they can take chances with with their games. Um, they don't have to worry about, you know, like with Resident Evil 6, it's a game that costs $30 million. If they include a queer character and people turn on this on, on them because of that, uh, they, they don't want to, uh, you know, to destroy their franchise. And, and so uh, there's a lot more at stake with, with, it, with a big AAA title. Okay. So uh, one of the things I did with this, because I, I usually, uh, when I interview people, it's usually typically game designers or creators or something, so... I was wondering, I reached out to my Facebook group, the club, and I was wondering what they would like to know about, you know, because a lot of us, we attend conventions almost uh, monthly. We go to, you know, Southern California, we have kind of this unique situation where there's kind of a gaming event or a convention going on almost every month. So I, I was wondering from the guys, you know, what, what would be one of the things that they're wondering about from a game promoter and a game, uh, or a convention promoter and a convention uh, organizer? And one of the questions that one of the guys was asking is, how do you present attending your convention? Uh, you know, how do you make that present that for value for people to come out and and enjoy it and spend their time and money there, as opposed to just staying at home with their friends or or going to a local store kind of situation where where it's a lot smaller group and it's a more controlled area. Sure. I mean, I think that in this case, it's all about community. I think that you know. With gaming, you know, every, like, there's, there's people who play games everywhere, and I think that, you know, if you want to just play games with other people, uh, you can do that, you know, pretty much anywhere and, and, and with any size. But um, up until the last couple of years, there really hasn't been any, any, you know, groups if you are a queer gamer. And I think for a lot of people who um, are queer gamers, you know, I don't think that being gay defines their life, but... It's always nice to know that the, you you have a community where uh, not only are you around people who enjoy the same things that you do, um, they also share the same kind of experiences and, and um, you know you know de- dealing with the same kind of issues that being that being queer you know comes with. Um, so I think that you know in the same way it, it, it's all about community. So it, even if it wasn't about LGBT, I think that you know even if if, if a game promoter was like oh well, we're gonna have a you know people who love the Skya meetup or whatever, and then those people have not only are they do they love video games, but they love this very one specific thing, and then that way they can really connect over that. And I think that's what what is really you know unique about GamerX is that um, everyone who's coming has you know multiple things in common. They love games, and they have a very kind of shared experience growing up as a gay geek or a queer geek, um, and you know they can kind of connect you know through that, and and, they, and we have that community there that they can't really get if they just go to a local event. Yeah, that, that's kind of cool. And community is, is a big, it's actually a growing thing, especially in the, that we've noticed on the tabletop side. Um, a lot of our guys came, you know, their video, we all play video games at one fashion or another, but a lot of us um, have noticed that people are kind of turning away from that just because you can sit at home with the headset all you want, but 
when you get out with your friends or you go to a convention and you do an event as a group, the, the sense of community, the, the socializing is, is way more engaging, there's less hostility, there's more willingness to, to get to know people and be engaging as opposed to just a voice over a headset. Is, is that one of the things you're finding with, with your event is people are just seeking out the faces behind the microphones that they're talking to and kind of hoping to just get a little bit of that face-to-face -face socialization going? Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, I think that on top of that, there's also the unique thing that with an LGBT convention, you know, I think that for a lot of people, they also, you know, like everyone, everyone's looking for love, and I think that uh, in a convention like this, you know, you actually are surrounded by, in general, uh, a, a dating pool that, you know, you can actually be like, oh, well, the, the potentially there are people here who also I can, you know, not just, just have something in common with, but there's also people here who... Um, you know, share the same sexual identity as me, and I think that that's something that at gaming conventions currently isn't really, you know, whether if you are a, because the male to female ba is uh, a ratio is so kind of imbalanced at gaming conventions and gaming hangouts, and uh, just in general the culture around that is really kind of awkward at the moment. It's not really a place you can go to to pick up women, and women certainly don't go there to pick up men. Um, and so there's kind of like a weird kind of like it, it's not a place you can you know find love. And I think there are a lot of queer geeks. Um, they're they're certainly looking. You know, a lot of them are very awkward and they're introverted. And being able to be in a place where there's thousands of other people just like them, and you know, they know that they know for sure that they share the common interests, and they know that if they, you know, they if they flirt with someone, they're not gonna uh, be harassed or they're not gonna be, you know, um, um, you know, they're not they're not gonna be put in danger. I think that that means a lot, and I think that, that that's an opportunity for them that they, they normally would never get. Yeah, that, that is one of the things with the, uh, you know, with most conventions is, is the the ratio, not only the, the, the girl to guy ratio is skewed, but there's a lot more need for the, that kind of aggro attendee where, where you're around a certain amount of people, you start to get a little amped up, and there's a little bit more need to be just a little bit more abrasive and... and off-putting to people, mm. you know, especially at the larger events. Um, what about as far as uh, now, a special guest? You're also going to have a special event at, at your guys' convention. This is kind of unique that I haven't seen at, at a lot of, well, at any of the events that I've attended. But you're actually going to, you guys are actually having a wedding there. Yeah, and and you know, this kind of came out of, um, you know, we have Ellen McLean, the voice of Glados. And she came last year, and she actually helped. Uh, you know, one of the Kickstarter rewards that we had was that you know you could get Ellen McLean to uh, do like a voice for you. You know, whether it be like leave a voicemail message or whatever. Uh, and this one guy, he bought the package and he you know 500 bucks or whatever, and he wanted her to uh, like make a proposal to her, his boyfriend. And he was like, oh, you know, would you mind singing, like, Still Alive and, you know, changing part of the lyrics to be like, you know, will you marry me? And uh, Ellen, because Ellen was coming, she was like, well, what if we just do it live at Gamer X? And, um, you know, everyone was really into it. Um, obviously, it was, a, it was a secret to the other guy that he's proposing to, and it went off really well, and everyone, you know, it was just an amazing video. If you actually, uh, if you Google or YouTube, uh, you know, the GamerX proposal. It's, it's, you know, our most popular video, and it's just a really amazing moment. And, um, you know, we, I think everyone was kind of wanting to see more of the guys, and I think, you know, because Ellen and John are coming back, uh, this was, was a nice opportunity to kind of, you know, it's, it's sort of like it makes this, this convention even more sequelary. You know, like there's a little bit of, of continuity in canon where, uh, you know, we had the proposal, and now we have the marriage, and... They're a really sweet couple, and it's going to be a, little, a nice little portal-themed wedding with Ellen, and um, it's going to be really cool. That's, that's kind of awesome. Yeah, you don't, you don't see that. You hear about people getting engaged at conventions, and it's usually just something small or something quick. But this, the, I watched the video, actually, and, and it was kind of cool to watch, and it was, it was really kind of – it was one of those moments where you know when you're watching it, you're watching something really unique and really – really kind of singular to, to that event, and it was kind of great to watch that and just see that happen. Yeah, and, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that, that you know, the, the wedding is going to be anything crazy, um, but, you know, I think that, that a lot of people really want to see, like, it's, a, it's just a nice fitting, like, you know, end, touching end to, like, the, the story where it's, like, 
they got you know they propose and now they're they're tying the knot and um, I don't know it's just a sweet little moment of like showing that um, you know there's there's love you know these are two big giant bears and they're both big geeks and you know they found love and I think that it's important to show people that like it doesn't matter who you are there's there's always someone out there who's you know who's perfect for you it's just you know it's it's kind of a little it's inspiring and cute and fun. Yeah, yeah it, it's very cool and and very unique to to, to conventions that that I have. It's in a, well to your convention. I haven't seen it before. Um, now I was looking at your different pledge levels, and and you're doing something that I haven't really. I've actually only seen it one other time on a convention Kickstarter. Um, and basically, where someone could buy badges and donate them to to other attendees. Mm-hmm. Um, that maybe wouldn't be able to to afford them. Uh, what what kind of inspired you guys to do that? Um, you know, a lot of people they, because our our prices this year are higher than last year, um, because of the new venue and because it's three days long. We had some people say like, wow, like you know that that price is a deal breaker for me, and you know that was really depressing because I, I certainly, especially with something that's like advocacy based, I certainly don't want anyone to get priced out, and that that's something that you know. Uh, you know, we need to make money. We have to survive, and we have to be able to pay for the convention. But um, if people legitimately can't afford to come, and they really want to come, this means something to them. I don't want them to not be able to come. And so, um, you know, we decided to work with Geeks Out, which is a uh, you know a organization that is a 501c3 that focuses on you know uh, advocacy for for queer geeks. And um, basically, we were like, hey, you know, we could. You know, for a lower price than people could pay buy for a ticket, people can donate a badge, and then uh, they they you know basically once now the Kickstarter is over, we'll we're giving the badges codes to them, and then people can submit through Geeks Out saying, hey, you know, I don't have the money, I'm broke, I'm a college student, whatever, uh, and then Geeks Out can distribute codes to people who you know deserve it and people who who legitimately can't afford to come otherwise. Um, and you know, obviously, there's going to be people who, who abuse that system, and that that happens with with any kind of uh, something like that. But it, I think it's still important that we at least get you know, if, if there's someone who really like really can't come, really needs to come, I mean, really wants to come, and and, and it's just out of their price range, I, I think that for something that is advocacy based and it's all about community, it would be you know disingenuous to not allow them to come. Um, and so uh, that's why we decided to to set up the donation. Uh, setting on on it. Yeah, that that's really admirable. Um, you know, like I said, I've only ever seen that on one uh, Kickstarter for a convention before, and that one was for a, a convention out in the Midwest, and it was still like a as part of one of their higher packages. It was, it's really kind of admirable that you guys are doing that, and you guys are, are still staying so close to your roots, where you're you're still maintaining that 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 closeness to the community instead of just growing beyond it and you know just saying oh well you know the price has changed you guys got to kind of deal with it and, and if you can make it you can't so that's that's not something you see a lot especially from conventions that that grow beyond where they started out at that kind of grassroots level. Yeah, I mean you know I think it's just important that you know as we get larger and as we get more attention. We don't forget, you know, why this happened, and the reason why this happened was out of the kindness of, of like, the only reason why Gamer X started is because we had a Kickstarter that did way better than we ever imagined, and a lot of that had to do with people donating money that they never, they didn't know if the Kickstarter, I mean, the convention was actually going to happen. They, a lot of them, didn't even expect that they were going to go, um, and and really was it was founded on people just hoping that we could provide a really cool experience to queer geeks and. You know, it's important that we pay that forward and we, we provide, you know, we, we don't just say, okay, now we're on the next level and now we're going to leave everyone behind unless you got money. Uh, I think that would just be really a really shitty thing to do. Okay. So um, now, now this next question, I'm not sure how to, how to quite phrase it. It might be a little bit. It's kind of on the the age restriction that you have on the, on the convention now. Sure. Um, because of, just because of insurance purposes and whatnot, but... Well, Oh, what, actually, how, oh, sorry, um, go ahead. No, um, oh, I was gonna, I was gonna finish up and just say, you know, how, how do you plan to, you know, reach those those people that aren't 18 yet that want to attend or that feel like they, they, you know, those teenagers that are, you know, when you're when you're a teenager and you're going through that realization that you're you may not be straight or you may be gay or, or lesbian or, or what, 
you know, what have you. H how do you plan to, to reach, you know, how do you plan to reach them when, when this may be something that, that actually benefits them a lot? You know, especially since they're dealing with, with the isolate, you know, a lot of isolation in high school. And, and we, you know, we both know that bullying in high school, especially for someone that questioning their own sexuality is difficult and, and kind of hard. Totally. I mean, it, and it's something that's really, you know, in an ideal world, I would love for this to be open to everyone. I mean, I I know how tough it was. I mean, I'm not that old yet. And I know how tough it was being a queer youth growing up and, you know, not having any resources or any kind of, you know, advocacy really that I could relate to. And so it stinks that we have to make it 18 plus. Um Especially because, you know, like, like the real reason why I've made this was for the 13-year-old me. You know, I know how much, when I was 13, how much I, I, I kind of felt like crap knowing that I was a gay geek and knowing how hard my life was going to be. I mean, it was hard enough being a geek and then knowing that I was gay. I was like, man, like, just it's just going to get attacked from all angles here. Um, and I want to provide that safe space for queer geeks, but the big issue is, is, is A, with insurance, you know, dealing with, with minors – provides a whole, you know, new level of, you know, of, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a lot more that goes into having to deal with minors. Um, and the biggest issue with that being, A, is there's an there's a insurance issue with that. But secondly, um, it's something that we, you know, I myself and no one really on the team, we don't have experience really dealing with minors. And I feel like in an environment like this, it would be inappropriate to, you know, provide an experience for minors that, uh, you know, we weren't really trained for or, or had the capability to do correctly. And, you know, God forbid that something bad happens, you know, it, it, I, I wouldn't be able to, you know, live with myself or, or you know, live with, like, I, 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 you know, I would want before we, we could do something like that, even if, if, if the insurance wasn't an issue, I would need to know that there's people on our team who are trained to, you know, deal with queer youth and, you know, people who make sure that, that the policies that we have in place are appropriate for queer youth. And, um, you know, I, I certainly want to continue to make, uh, you know, do stuff for queer youth. And so part of what we do is, you know, we put up all of our panels on YouTube so that way if you couldn't come, you could watch them. Um, we were a part of the Queer Hack for Queer Youth. Uh, event and you know just things like that like we, we want to try to be more involved in the queer youth community um, and if there's a way in the future that we can make Gamera X open to all ages that would be great um, it's just you know right now it's just kind of like it's a very logistical nightmare especially with the fact that it's a queer event and you know um, if we get a lot of hate and threats just from doing what we're doing um, if it was open to all ages it would be ten times worse because then now we're corrupting people's children, um, and it's, uh, that's a whole other, you know, I don't know, I, that's a whole other battle that I'm not sure we're yet ready to battle. No, that, that's totally understandable, I just, uh, I was just curious about how you guys came about that, that, because it's a big decision to make, it's not, it's not something that, that you can just say, no, you know, we're not going to deal with the kids this year, or last year, you know, it, it's, it is a, it sounds like you guys took, you took, you at least took a lot of thought, and, and, consideration before you decided that that was going to be something that you did and, and you know it's, it's totally understandable yeah I mean it's 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 regrettable in that you know I I wish that we could do it I wish that we had the resources to do it and I wish that I knew that we could do it without you know there being any any you know um, anything negative coming out of it um, but you know we just don't have the experience dealing with minors and it's it's just a uh, you know it, it would add a, a level of cost that we also can't, you know, afford at the moment. No, that that's true. Have you um, considered partnering with a youth advocacy group that deals with with, you know, uh, queer minors and and their issues, and maybe doing just like a one day event for them, maybe at a local, uh, you know, on a smaller scale where it's just an environment for them where where you do the cut off at like seventeen and and you just partner up with another group and, and just kind of have them help you guys through it or I mean I think that sounds really awesome actually I think that that's something that you know we haven't really uh, approached too heavily but that's something that you know if, if we could chat with like you know the, the local San Francisco Gay and Lesbian Center or different groups in the city if there are you know people who are working with queer youth who uh, you know we can help kind of you know drive queer youth to either 
you know, making games or having like a symposium or a day, you know, where they can kind of just geek out and meet one another. I think that would be super awesome. Um, so yeah, for sure. Um, I, I think that I think it'd be super cool. I mean, I think if we did something like that, we would want it to be free and open to everyone. And that's also, I mean, that's another. Re- I mean, this is lower on the list, but I, I would feel. I also would feel. I, I don't know how I would feel about charging minors to, to come to our event because I mean I feel like this is you know I want queer youth to have access to this and especially a, you know a lot of queer youth uh, especially you know I mean more more homeless kids are, are queer youth than I mean sorry more queer youth are homeless than any other uh, you know youth group um, and a lot of it is I mean, because they, they get stoned they get thrown in the house or they have to leave or whatever. And so I, I certainly don't want, again, price to be something that's, like, making people not be able to afford coming. So if, uh, I would be re- I, it would be really cool if we could partner with a, uh, a local youth advocacy group or LGBT center to provide, like, a, a, day, a day event that, you know, was free or sponsored. So that way, you know, we could, we could have a, a free event where queer youth could come together and geek out. Yeah, I definitely think that would be cool. It's I think it'd be plausible. But, you know, if you do wind up doing something like that, I'd I'd appreciate it if you'd let me know. I'd love to to talk to you more. If you do, you know, down the road, you know, at the end of the year into next year, if you start getting something like that going, I would definitely love to talk to you about it and and spread the word and, and you know try and and see what you know I could pull together just from the the tabletop gaming community to try and help you guys out. Yeah, and I think that that's something that you're probably going to see, um, you know, beyond after Gamer X2, I think that we're realizing that we probably don't want to go um, larger in terms of, like, continuing to make our event bigger and bigger, because I think that that's something where, because we are a, a, a niche event in a way, I think it would make more sense to look at doing smaller events, like doing a, you know, a symposium for queer youth, maybe a day event in New York, maybe a day event in San Francisco, you know, looking at, at doing smaller events that, you know, that way, you know, because the thing is that, like, if you're a queer geek and you live in New York and you don't have a ton of cash, flying out to San Francisco and getting a hotel in San Francisco is, you know, like, whatever our ticket price is, the the, the cost of all that is, is far, far, far more than the ticket price. And that's what really is costing people the chance of coming. And I, I feel really bad that I'm depriving a lot of people of this experience because it's in San Francisco, so... Um, you know, you may see us probably with GamerX looking to expand beyond just doing it on the West Coast. Um, oh, a little bit like PAX does, where they do PAX East and PAX Prime, and, and then they do PAX Australia now. Yeah, I mean, we would love to take GamerX, you know, everywhere. It's, it's just really about, you know, what the demand is, what the need is. I mean, obviously, it's something that is a little bit, it's, this is a little bit more niche, but, uh, you know, even if it's 5 to 10% of the gaming community, that's, you know... A huge, you know, everybody games, as as we say. And you know, it's a it's a niche community, but I could actually see it doing well in New York and Miami, um, and Long Beach down in Southern California. Um, you know. Yeah, there's. I mean, there's 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 queer geeks everywhere, and I think that not just queer geeks, but you know, people who are allies of it, people who, I mean, there's a reason why LGBT film festivals do really well. And there's a reason why a lot of non-gay people go to those uh, those things it's because people appreciate the culture, they appreciate you know the the art and the work, and I think that as more people you know see that hey, gaming is more than just Call of Duty and God of War. There's actually tons of really great games. I mean, we're seeing uh, a rise of these indie games like Papers Please and, and and you know Jazz Punk and all these these weird games that while they may be made by straight people and whatever, they don't have anything to do necessarily with queer themes. They are games that are revolving around completely new ideas and completely things things that have never been explored before. And I think that you know, as we get more queer developers and as we get more themes, whether it be queer or not, we're going to just continue to see all these very unique and awesome you know, game ideas. And I think that um, the more that we can encourage more diversity and more more uh, different minds coming to the table, being like, hey, you know, it, it's it's you know, as Anna Anthropy, who's a you know well-known trans game designer. You know, she made a book, and you know, basically being like, anyone can make a game. You know, you, you know, if you don't know how to make a game, pick up Twine; it's free, and make a choose your own adventure game. And it's it's anyone can do it, and there's no reason why you shouldn't. And um, you know, uh, I actually today met with the founder of the Games for Diversity Jam, and he does a bunch of different um, you know games like game jams around the world. And he was showing me the games that they had made at the Games for Diversity Jam. 
And, you know, some of them are good, some of them are awful, but they were all unique, and they all came from a perspective that was distinctly different than what you would normally see from the gaming world. And it was really refreshing to see that, like, you know, when you give people the opportunity to make something, and you say, you know, just make, make it from your heart, you know, just, just make something. And a lot, people will make things that, you know, some of it's crap, but some of it's amazing, and some of it is just stuff that's, like, you know, you would just never see if the gaming, if, if we didn't challenge the norms in the gaming world. Yeah, that, that's definitely, uh, yeah, there is definitely a metamorphosis, I guess, going on in the industry across the board, though, everywhere you look at uh, video games, tabletop games, um, the way stores are functioning, uh, you know, GameStop is, is there's there's a big backlash against their their practices and their policies and and you know they they in some places they're the only game in town but then you've got these indie stores that are opening up selling the exact same products but for a reasonable cost yeah and, i mean I, I think that in general i mean i think that you know as the gaming industry has now gone from being a little you know game thing for for your little boys to now being a, a something that everyone does, and it's a part of you know ga gamification is a part of everything, and games are, are everywhere, and everyone plays games in some fashion. Whether you are a you know my my stepmom who plays Candy Crush, to you know my sister who, who you know plays you know whatever Angry Birds or whatever, to Dark Souls and and you know Metal Gear Solid Five, like you know games range you know go they go across the entire range of of age ranges. And people, and I think that we're really seeing a big change and shift in the way that people view games and what what gamers are. Yeah, I think that has a lot to do with the industry itself, kind of growing with you know uh, with and basically gaming. When I was a kid, was was in its infancy. Basically, they were learning to walk at that point. Uh, and I'm not that much. I don't think I'm that much older than you. I'm I'm in my 30s, so early 30s. Uh, yeah, well, and, and that's the thing is that, you know, gaming is, is a very, 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 very new medium. Um, you know, newer than TV, obviously newer than music and movies. Um, and, you know, people forget that. You know, it, it really was only 30 years ago when it even hit the mainstream. And, you know, and even then it was a it was very basic and, and it was still a very kind of small industry. And it wasn't until the 90s that it started really blowing up. So, you know, considering that it, that it's really only been a popular form of media for 20, 30 years, um, there's still a lot of things that, you know, comic books have been around for 100 years. Uh, you know, all these other feed mediums have been around hundreds of years, or not hundreds, but 100 years, or TV 70, 80, whatever years. And so they've had time to, you know, grow and to in have more inclusion. And I think that, well, you know, now, in, over the last couple of years, people have been fighting for more women in games, more women game developers, more trans game developers, more, you know, things like that. You know, having more inclusivity from, from both the developer side, from the storyline side, and, and by doing that, I think that, you know, there's obviously been resistance, and you see that all, you know, all the time, and people are, like, attacking people like Anita Sarkeesian, because, like, oh, well, they're bringing up these issues of, of you know, why is, why are these games misogynistic, and they, you know, people get offended because they're, they're, they're scared that that will... And all of a sudden, this this person's trying to come in and ruin games for them, and you know they can disagree with with her points, but there's nothing wrong with someone coming in and being like, "Here are some things that I personally find problematic, and here's why." And I think that it's good to have those discussions, even if you disagree 100%. Um, I think that's important that we not just have those discussions, but we encourage those discussions. We shouldn't be like, "Oh, you know, this this woman's stupid. She doesn't know what she's talking about." Even if you just if you think that she's wrong, you should say. Here's why she's wrong, X, Y, and Z. Instead of just being like, uh, like, oh, another another female gamer. She doesn't know what she's talking about because she's a woman, which is which is silly. I mean, there's 45% of gamers are women, and you know, it, it's it's certainly gonna just continue to go. I think even more uh, female gamers because as they realize that like, you know, there are games that are made by women. There's games made specifically for women. Women are are uh, almost uh, uh, the majority of gamers, and um, they, you know, more and more are, are becoming a, a major part of the gaming landscape. Do you, uh, it, it's interesting that you touched on the, on the women's aspect of it and their evolution into, into gaming, I think, and like I was, you know, I was saying before, the the more that we mature as, as people, I think the gaming industry is maturing with us and, and views are opening up, but 
there, there's been a lot of talk lately about women being, you know, treated as second-class citizens in the industry and just not talking about it because they don't want to get frozen out. And, and, you know, if you complain or you become that that voice of of, uh, of conflict within a developer circle or a gaming, and, and, you know, in the industry, you're kind of frozen out. Do you find that similar talk coming out of the the gay and lesbian community in the gaming industry from insiders? Or do you think they've got it maybe just uh, there's a little bit less of that attitude towards them as there is towards women in um, general? Well, I mean, so gays and lesbians have, uh, and, and trans people to an extent, they have a, a privilege in that if you are a woman or you're presenting as a woman, you're a, you come off as a woman. And there's really no way of, of you know, like you're a woman. Uh, if you're gay or lesbian, you have the choice, and I don't, you know, I, I, there's the whole politics behind it, but you have the choice to decide whether you want to present yourself as straight and choose to, you know, basically lie through omission and just not mention that you're gay. And so I think for a lot of people, and I know people in the game industry who are closeted, and they feel like that, you know, if they were to come out, it would negatively affect their career. Maybe they're right. Um, but I don't think that that's a, you know, a good way of living, and I think that if, if that is the case, then there's something wrong with the game industry. Um, and, you know, and, and since that is the case, and I know there are people who are still in the closet, you know, I think that we need to make sure that people know that it is safe to come out, that, you know, that it's not going to make it so people aren't going to want to work with you, and, you know, that, 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 you know, that people who are queer uh, are welcome, and I think that um, you know, for, for women gamers, I think, and women developers, it's been something that's it's it's a tougher battle in that they have to deal with it no matter what. You know, if you are a gay person or you are a lesbian or, or even trans, you can just say nope. You know, you can just 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 you know ignore the, you can just ignore the issue, never bring up that you're gay or lesbian. Just kind of just just you know uh, let it pass and kind of you know swallow your pride, which is awful. But you don't have to deal with that issue necessarily. You can choose to run from it, and women don't have that option. Yeah. Okay. That's it's good. All, but all, and, and also, I mean, you know, there's just the numbers game of there are more women than there are queer people, and that's just a fact. Uh, and there are more women in the games industry than there are queer people, and um, I think that that's also another reason why it's really risen to the forefront is that there are you know tons of women who game, and there are tons of women in the game industry. And I think that they're all kind of getting sick of the way that they're treated, and they want to change that. Um, I think that gay people and queer people feel the same way, but we also don't have the same amount of numbers, um, which is, you know, just that's just a that is what it is. It's, there's just less queer people than women. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't actually thought about it that way. Uh, it's something I'd never considered. I mean, it's just, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just sort of like a numbers game in a way, you know. Yeah, the proportions are just against them, unfortunately, just because there are so many more. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, one of the things that I've been wondering about is, is I understand the need for the event, and, and, you know, it totally makes sense, and it resonates with the community, obviously. Do you foresee a time within the next 10 years when, when a, something like this, something that specifically caters to the community isn't needed, and it's you know, everybody can kind of just go to events together and, and there's that, inc that that inclusiveness? Or do you think there's always going to kind of be a need for for the, the uh, gay and lesbian community to kind of have their own venue and their own event where they can kind of just congregate and, and everyone can be amongst, you know, amongst their, their, their like-minded and, and liked people? Um, that that you know, came out right, didn't it? I was trying try not to stumble over words. No, no, they, they can't write. And uh, I, um, you know, I actually at GDC I gave a talk where I said that the idea behind GamerX is, in essence, stupid, because there shouldn't be a need for your sexuality to define you know who you are. There shouldn't be a need for you to say I need to go to this because I'm a queer geek. And so when I have all these straight people who come on. To our videos being like, this is stupid. This is like, I don't get it. I don't. This is you know dumb. At its core, and as an idea, they're right. It should be. We should be an equal society. You should be able to go to, to E3 packs and feel comfortable. You should be able to not. You know, when you go out gaming with people, you should be able to express your sexuality, and, and no one gives a shit. 
But the fact is that's not the case. That is not the reality. And therefore, people need a safe space where they can come together and, and, you know, and, and be a part of the community. I would love to be in five, ten years at a point where gamers feel like, what's the point of going to GamerX? I can just go to any other gaming convention. I know I'll be respected. I know that no one's going to give me crap. And that's great. And if that's the case, I would be very, I would be more than happy to just to, to, to shut down GamerX because I, I don't want there, you know, like I, I don't want to be uh, like a, a division, and, you know, and the, I, I certainly don't want there to be like, oh, well, there's the gay gamers and there's the, the you know, the straight gamers. Uh, that's not the point. The point is that these people don't have a safe space yet, and this is a place where they can have a set safe space and discuss things. But at the end of the day, they should be a part of the larger picture, and they, they, they should be welcome into the larger picture. And uh, I, I think, I, and I hope that that is what we're leading towards. Um, I, I don't believe that we should be like that, that you know, GamerX is ghettoizing them, and I don't believe that that is uh, uh, something that we want to, you know, like continue to have a division there. Um, I think that if and when the gaming community becomes more accepting of women and queers, people of color, I think that you'll see, I mean, even here in San Francisco, I'm seeing gay bars become more and more. I mean, sorry, less and less attended by young people because young people don't feel the need to go to a bar that defines by their sexuality. They go to a bar that defines their interests. And the reason for that is that if you in San Francisco were to hit on a guy who is straight, he's not, they're not going to be offended. They'll be like, no, I'm into women, and that's it. You're not going to get any – it's not going to be like in – you know, in, in, if anyone's in Oklahoma, sorry – but it's not going to be like in Oklahoma where if you go to an, right, you know, some random dive bar and you hit on a guy, you might get beaten up. That, you know, so, and that's why people go to gay bars in, in, in a lot of places because they know it's a safe space. Same way here. They know it's a safe space. But I would love for that day to come when it's like, you know what, I know for a fact I can go to, you know, and I'm not, not single out Pax or I'm just saying, I can go to Pax or I can go to E3. And I know for a fact that if I go there with my boyfriend and, you know, give him a kiss on the cheek or we're cosplaying together, whatever, that I know no one's going to give me shit. I know that I'm going to be in a safe space. Then that's all that I think that, that, that queer people want. Um, and I think that sometimes when, when people look at gamer action from the outside, they say, oh, they just want their own special thing, which is, is not the case. I don't think we want our own special thing. I mean, I don't. And, and I, you know, at the end of the day, I don't. I don't. I, I see Gamer X as being an unnecessary good, where it's like it should, end, at the end of the day, not be necessary. And I, I hope that it will eventually be unnecessary, um, because you know I, I think that community is always important. And um, having a gay, I mean, a, a spot for queer gamers to come together and be queer, um, if that if that need is still there, just because it's like, hey, I would like to meet other queer gamers, whether it be to date or to talk about stuff. If that need's there, then great. But um, I don't think that the need for a safe space should need to exist. I think that that should be implied with all gaming uh, conventions and meetups. Yeah, that's 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 very true. And a lot of the new, a lot of the the established conventions, I think, are adopting new policies about harassment in general of attendees. I know for a while there was this big talk about attending women or uh, harassing women or, or being, you know inappropriate and stuff and I think a lot of that is starting to resonate down to to the other uh, facets that attend the conventions you know um, the the gay and lesbian community included in that and a lot of the harassment policies have been evolving I've noticed over the last I mean I've been attending conventions since the 90s and and there's been a slow evolution uh, as far as the policies go and enforcement on that so it seems like something that it would is realistically within the next maybe not even ten years, very feasible to, to, to have people feel included at all events. Yeah, no, and I, I think that, you know, as long as we, you know, one of the bosses of honor that we that we uh, have this year, you know, John Scalzi, you know, he made a point, he made a big blog post being like, I, he's not gay, uh, but he's like, I don't go to any conventions now that I, I don't know that if, unless they have a really strong anti-harassment policy. And part of that is, like, it's important that, you know, conventions lay out the rule because the conventions at the end of the day, they need to be the ones at the top of the ladder saying, here is what we, here's what is acceptable behavior and here's what's not acceptable behavior at our convention. And, like, it's, it's simple stuff, like, cosplay is not consent. Just because a woman is dressed up and dress, or dressed up 
provocatively. That doesn't mean that you're allowed to just touch her without her permission. It's not allowed to just take, you know, pictures. Like it's you still got to like they are dressing up and they are doing it for everyone's benefit. They're dressing up and having fun. That doesn't mean that you're now allowed to just treat them as an object. They are still humans, and I think that it's important that we, in the same way with you know, um, it's just important that we have anti-harassment policies. We provide safe spaces for everyone, and that can be as simple as you know, uh, including including gender-neutral bathrooms. Uh, that way, if you're trans or or non-gender binary, you know that I don't have to make you know make that decision. And then if I go into the the, the wrong bathroom, that the, um, they're gonna I'm gonna get yelled at. Um, or, you know, uh, uh, like at our convention, we have gender pronoun stickers that are just like, hey, my name is Tony, and my preferred pronoun is, is she. Um, and that's, you know, that way if someone comes up to you, they know, that, you know, to refer to you by female pronouns. Easy, it costs us almost nothing to do, and it makes those people who it's important for feel like they actually belong there, because they, they should. And I think that all conventions should adopt these really small changes that make everyone feel welcome. That, that's that's really kind of cool, and and you know, and again, it's it's very forward thinking um, as far as it goes. Um, you know, those kinds of changes and things. But I, I do see the the convention scene, at least at the larger events where where there have been issues. Um, I see that evolution in the policies and and the enforcement of those policies. I mean. Uh, you know, I, I attend the larger conventions down here in SoCal, and if you if you screw up at a big convention, you're gonna you're either gonna get yanked from that convention, or you're gonna be talked to right away as soon as something happens. Typically, because they're they're always watching now to make sure that things aren't happening on their watch, and, and yeah. they you know they're in the end. I think a convention has to protect its name because if you can't protect your attendees, then your name's not gonna be worth very much as as an event to people you know for people to want to attend. Totally, and and you know I, I don't want to put too much blame on the conventions themselves, especially when it's an isolated event that potentially may not have been their their fault. You know, I, I don't know. I've seen you know, whether it be at Gamescom or E3 specific you know, specific things that really were out of E3's control. But it's important that it's you know I would like to see less apologizing for this or that that happens, and more like. Here are very clear, laid out things that we expect from people at the convention, and we expect that if you're attending, that you understand that this is expected of you, but also why. And it's, it's simple stuff, just of treating people with respect. You know that that there are people who you know would be offended by these specific words, and you know it's important that like you know it, there's there's there should be no reason why that why you need to use a, a specific word when some other group of people are like. That word is offensive to me. That word hurts me. There's no word out there that's important enough that you're like, I well, you know, I, I just can't play the play Call of Duty unless I can use the N word. That's just part of how I do it. Like, yeah, no. I mean, you know, like, well, you know, but honestly, you know, about five, no, maybe less than five years ago, there was an attitude at conventions where people would complain about things, and the convention staff, in a lot of cases, wouldn't they wouldn't give it the the gravity that it needed. Because it just wasn't there, you know. They, they, they didn't see the need for, for, to, you know. And, and that 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 was kind of. I attended a lot of conventions, and and not to say it was across the board, but it was quite frequent where where various members of staff, not necessarily the entire convention itself, but they they just wouldn't give certain situations the gravity that it needed. And, and yeah, and I think part of it is you know we've been fighting hard to, to you know make sure that that people understand the importance of of you know. Of, of dealing with these things and treating them more seriously, but also, you know, diversity and uh, attention to these things, it all comes from the top. Uh, and that's part of the reason why, I mean, I don't know if you saw the news the other day, but uh, Firefox just appointed their new CEO, and the new CEO is someone who gave money to Prop 8, um, you know, to, to ban gay marriages within the state. And, you know, so a lot of gay developers have started to boycott Firefox, and it's not that, you know, you know, it's it's something that was like it's one thing for this guy to be an employee of, of Firefox and to have given money to basically a hate a hate law. Um, because, you know, you're an employee, you have every right to do, you know, whatever you want, support whatever you want. That's that's fine. When you're the CEO, and I'm the CEO of, of my business, when you're the CEO, what you say and what you do and the and the, the, the rights and the diversity and, and the way that you've you've Frame things that trickles down through all levels of the of the business, 
And when you're saying it's okay to spend money to single out a specific group of people and, and de deny their rights, what does that say about your company? What does that say to what, – what message does that send to your employees? And I think it's the same way with conventions, the same way with gaming companies. It's important that the message comes from the top. You know, it can't just be uh, people who are volunteers being like, I want to help support diversity. Those people are great. It needs to be people for the top that understand it's important and are willing to work on ways of improving. Yeah, that's definitely true. One of the things that, you know, I would like to see uh, events like yours kind of evolve to is including, um, you know, it, it's a great event, and I love that, that you guys do the stuff that you're doing and that you're thinking about doing other things. Uh, it, it's something to include uh, families, you know, uh, gay couples with, with kids and stuff where, where they can turn a, uh, like a one-day event into a family thing where, you know, it, it is harder for <clears throat> gay and lesbian couples to find things to do when they've got children, you know, without getting that sense of judgment that they get, some, you know, that people get sometimes. And the same thing with my wife and I where, you know, she's, she's Caucasian and I'm not. And, you know, every once in a while we get the odd treatment when we go out and stuff. It, it's not yeah. necessarily on the same level, but it would, it would be nice to, to find something like that where, where you know, the, the families could be included. Totally. And I think that's something that, like, you know, even, even this year over last year, uh, I, I know two couples who have recently adopted children, and, you know, they, they really want to bring their kids to the convention. And I feel kind of heartbroken because I love them, and they're great people, and their kids are adorable, and I want them to, you know, be able to come into a world where there's... You know, they can go to these places that are very open and welcoming, and it's just tough because you know right now it's it's just uh, the the political landscape, especially around families and LGBTs, is just so. I mean, it, we can only fight so many battles, you know. Uh, and right now we're really focusing on on you know queers and gaming, and we want to be able to do stuff for families. We want to be able to do stuff for youth. Um, but we have a very you know we don't we were all bootstrap. All the money is all come from our own you know, pockets, or, or, you know, or through Kickstarter. No, we don't have any private funding. Um, and so, you know, we can only, we have to limit what we can focus on and, uh, and what we can do well. But ultimately, yes, I agree. I think that at the end of the day, I would love to make it be not just GamerX, but in general, I would like to see more events for people who um, have families, people who have kids, people who want to show their kids that there are, you know, that despite what hate they may see on Fox News or on the internet or whatever, there's actually, you know, millions of other people who are actually really awesome, really accepting, awesome, you know, great people. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and, and I think that it's going to all change, you know, with, with time. I think, um, you know, as a quick plug, you know, we're doing a game called Read Only Memories. It comes out um, later this year, and it's a cyberpunk adventure game that takes place 50 years in the future, and, you know... A hundred years ago, if you were Italian, you couldn't date an Irish person. And, you know, 50 years ago, and even now, you still see a little bit of this residue where, like, interracial dating was, you know, you know like, that was, like, the worst thing that could ever happen. And now most people, especially young people, they, they don't care. They don't even think about it. And in the same way now, I think queer stuff, young, young you know, people, people who grew up in the last 10, you know, 10 to 20 years, they don't care. Like, they just are like, that isn't an issue to them. And I you think know, that it's, that will... it, it, it is an evolution. I'm actually because I've got three kids under seven. Um, yeah. And my oldest at one point was, it was, I think it was Anderson Cooper. He was watching. And he said, "Oh, that guy's gay." And my wife and I were like, well, "Do you know? Do you know what that means?" And he goes, "Yeah, it means he loves another man." And then he walked away and left it at that because it was that straightforward, simple for him. And we we're kind of like, "Okay, he's paying attention to something. I don't know what, <laughs> but." But he, yeah. he knew, to, to him it was just like, oh no, he just it was just a statement of fact for him, and he just left it at that. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I think it's one of those things where you know, 50, 60 years ago, I mean, especially if you're living in the South, you know, you would say, oh well, there's there's an African American person, and there's all these negative connotations that come with it. And nowadays, it's like you don't have though those things aren't ingrained. We don't we haven't taught that hate to our gen our children. And in the same way, a lot of kids nowadays, they, they just don't, you know, it, it isn't a big deal. Like, you know, I'm sure that your, your child is on, you know, the Internet and whatever. And, you know, when you're on Tumblr, like, all these things, like, like being gay or lesbian or trans or whatever, like, like that isn't an issue. That is, is something that is actually 
pretty celebrated. Um, and that means that as they grow up, they're going to be, you know, that much, you know, they're going to be like you, but even more, you know, like they, they don't have that ingrained hatred that we were taught, even as a kid. And I remember even growing up hating myself because I was like, you don't see any gay or lesbian people on TV. And it, was, it wasn't until Will and Grace and Ellen, and by that time, you know, I'd already kind of, it was like 13, 14, it was already had come out. And it was really, you know, you, you didn't have any role models growing up. And now, all these people can grow up and be like, well, Ellen Page is queer, and Zachary Quinto, and this person, and that person, and there's Michael Sams in the NFL, and it's like, there's queer gay people that are successful in every, like, industry at this point. Not every, but, you know, it's, it, we're getting there. And I think that more and more, like, if young kids grow up, they don't have to be like, oh, God, if I come out, my life's over. Because they can see, like, hey, there's, a, there's all these other people who are wildly successful, who ended, who are also gay, and they made it, they made it despite that. And I think that that's really, really important. And I think it's the same way as, like, you know, when in the 60s and 70s, as we celebrated, whether it be Sidney Poitier or it be someone like Jackie Robinson, you know, breaking barriers. In the same way, these queer people are breaking barriers and they're showing young queer people that there's nothing to be afraid of. You can do anything and that the world is changing. Yeah, that's definitely it, – it, it's something that I'm – I never thought about it before because we never – you know, we never thought about – it was something that we were going to have to talk about with the kids. And then when he did that, it was kind of like, oh, all right, that takes care of that, I guess, if it ever comes up. Yeah. <laughs> it's just interesting because it's never – we don't just, you know, we don't make issues about race or anything just because we are a mixed-race couple. We never talk about things like that. We don't make issues of them, and we try not to – and if we do, we don't try and talk about anything like that in front of the kids. So it was always just like, oh, all right, well, thanks. <laughs> Glad you you figured that out without us telling you. So, yeah, it was, you know it was kind of cool to to watch this evolution with my kids as they're getting older and the the preconceived notions and everything that we were raised with generation ago they're they're coming up with and they don't even have these 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 things that they have to you know figure out for themselves whether or not it's good or bad or how they feel about something you know and it's 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 kind of this place where you shouldn't have to decide whether or not someone's lifestyle is good or bad because it doesn't matter. It's not your life. And right. I'm just kind of glad that he's already got that mindset where, you know, okay, it is what it is, you know, no big deal. I mean, that also speaks to, you know, your parenting ability and that you've taught him to think for himself and, and think constructively and, and uh, you know, it, like, yeah, I mean, you, you obviously haven't taught him hate, which is really important because – you know that's gonna help him that much be that much more successful growing up because he knows you know that who cares like I mean that 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 isn't a defining character okay Anderson Cooper's gay great anyways you know it's like yeah that's just, you know like that's just one I mean let's be like okay that guy's black that's just one one characteristic of hundreds about that person and I think that that's important that young people are seeing that you know being gay does not define who you are it defines a part of your life, and it's an important part of your life, but certainly it is not who you are. No, definitely. Um, what about in the community itself, the surrounding area, the city, and and you know those civic leaders have have you gotten good support from them uh, in your local area and your scope of, of what you you know where you guys are at, what you're doing, or have you kind of just done it on your own and not really tried to reach out and, and get in touch with them for support? Yeah, unfortunately, it's been the latter, and it's something that that's something that I, I've regretted not yet really pushing, um, because I think that if I really, really shout out to the community, um, I think there's probably a lot of resources that are, would be available to us, and it's just something that I I haven't really done. I don't really have a lot of experience with that. Um, I'm more you know connected into the, the tech and gaming world, um, but I think that you know based on what we're doing. Uh, I think there's probably a lot of resources that would be available to us if, if we just tried. Um, so I would like to re I would like to connect with local politicians and leaders and you know the city and see how they can help support what we're doing because I think that what we're doing is is actually you know really really beneficial to the city and the city's you know queer population. So um, I I I think it's just something that uh, I need to get off my butt and, and make happen. Yeah, it'd be you know there, there's always you're you're always surprised who who helps you with things and and projects and and stuff when you're working on stuff. I know when I was, you know, my convention season this year was going to be a little 
but if you start reaching out to companies and I wound up getting a ton of just you know just saying hey this is what I'm doing you guys mind throwing me a little bit of support and I a couple mailbox loads of stuff later I wound up getting support I wound up getting you know them pushing my event at, at a convention because they were there I was there and they were like no no we're gonna help you out you know it's, it's a good time for everybody so yeah. it's always surprising where the support comes from too yeah and also I mean you know I think just as a general rule when you, with business it's like just, just try. I mean, never hurts to reach out. Worst thing is that they'll say no, or just uh, not respond. <laughs> yeah, or not respond. I mean, which which just sucks. And sometimes that can be a little disheartening. But you know, you only strike out when you when you don't swing. So you might as well try. So I had been trying to reach out to you uh, a couple weeks before your 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 Kickstarter ended, and we were never able to coordinate anything. But how soon did it take you guys to reach your goal? We actually hit our goal day one. Oh wow! So that was really, really awesome and really inspiring. Um, I think that we realized that we made a small mistake in that, you know, with the Kickstarter, you know, we really wanted to raise obviously as much money as possible because uh, the ten thousand dollars was just to, you know, for a deposit. Um, and I think that realizing that when we set the, that goal that low, once we hit our goal, a lot of people were like, okay, they're good, they don't need any more money. Um, when really, you know, we we, we do need you know, to, to continue to sell tickets and raise money if we want this to be, you know, at least even break even. Um, yeah. But it still went really well in that, you know, we asked for 10 grand and we got 10 grand in, in 24 hours. Um, you know, we, we, we raised 24 grand total over the, over the 30 days, so you know, we didn't do uh, extremely well. But, uh, you know, that's still, it's hard to say that $25,000 is a failure. It's just, uh, it's, um, you know, we, we just need to kind of look at that and be like, okay, like that's the current interest level, uh, and now we know how many more tickets we need to sell to make this a, a break-even adventure, and um, just get the word out there and get and, and let not just queer people, but gaming people of all sizes and shapes and, you know, ethnicities and sexual orientations know that this is a spot for everyone. There are, you know, tons of, I mean, mo about half of our speakers are, you know, not queer at all, but that'd be Zach Wienersmith, creator of SNBC Comics, Alexis Ohanian, founder of uh, of Reddit, uh, you know, Alan McLean, the voice of GLaDOS, and then even just like, you know, obviously uh, uh, Darren Young, who's he's gay, but he's, you know, he's a, as a, he's a professional WWE wrestler, so it's like, we have people who are, are straight, we have people who are like celebrities, we have people who are like, that, that don't just appeal to LGBT people, so we want to show people this is a really a gaming convention for everyone, but also a safe space for LGBT and queer folks. Yeah, definitely. So as far as ticket numbers looking at, what are you guys looking at now? How how close are you to to being to that that point where you guys are going to break even and be good? Um, I think that so right now we've sold about half of the tickets that we we need to sell. Um, we would like to you know at least double that to to kind of get to break even. Uh, obviously, you know we, we I don't work a like I'm doing this full time, so I would like. To, to at least make enough profit to, to eat, um, but you know this this was never about money, and I'm happy to take a loss if I have to. Um, I just want I want Game Rex to be able to continue, and I want this to be something that you know is sustainable, um, and that's the biggest issue is just making enough money to make sure that we can pay off the hotel, the taxes, the insurance, the talent, you know, the hotel rooms, all of those things. Which add up pretty substantially, um, uh, and, and you know, if, and if we can, then we can keep doing it, and if not, then we can't. And so, uh, right now, it's all about getting the word out, selling tickets, getting sponsors, making it happen. It's definitely cool. Um, yeah, that's it's definitely awesome. So you you guys have had some some good press response as well too. I was noticing, and I remember reading last year for the Kickstarter. Um, you guys had had some good response on the on the from the press, and that was pretty good. Are you guys gonna are you getting that same kind of support this year um, with your write ups, or are you have you not got any contact yet with anybody? Um, in between, I mean, definitely not as much press as last year. But I think also because we were both a joke and a novelty last year, where it was like a gay gaming convention, Whoa. and you know, a lot of there was a lot of people who were like, "This is really funny. You're stupid," or whatever. But we got a lot of press because of that. Uh, this year, because we had our first year and it went really well, um, I think that there was a lot less press because it wasn't a joke anymore. 
people realized this was really legit. Um, but because it was a second year, it also had lost a lot of its novelty factor. Um, and so a lot of companies were like, okay, so they're doing the second year. Like, what's the news article here? And you know, a lot of people covered it, but there wasn't as much of like a gravity to like, this is as important. Um, and because it's our second year, we don't have as much of attraction as we would have the third or fourth or fifth year. We already have sponsors lined up at the door and this and that and, you know, a, a community already there. So the second year is definitely, I, I feel like this has been a hard year just because uh, we, we have had trouble getting as much press as last year, and we don't have the brand recognition yet that, that you know, that, you know and I'm sure it was the same for PAX. It's like the second year is the hardest one because it's, it's not new, and it's not established yet either. So it's Yeah, it's sophomore year is always the hardest one. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, we're working our butts off just to try to avoid the sophomore slump. Um, and I think I think we can do it, but it's it's been tough. It's definitely not been as a cakewalk. How many at the door tickets are you thinking that you're going to be able to? Are you going to sell? Do you think, or are you think you know? Are you hoping a lot of these are just going to be pre-sales that you're going to reach your goal at, or do you are you anticipating quite a turnout for the at the door sales? Um, I mean, ultimately, I would love to sell out before before the convention. Um, last year we didn't do that, and last year we did uh, about twenty percent of our, our sales at the door. Um, and I'd be more than fine with that. Um, but, you know, just because of the, the cost of putting on the convention, the more sales that we can get before the convention, the more money that we have to know that we can do the events that we need to do. Um, because if people are buying their tickets at the door, you know, we don't see that money until after the convention, and then it's, uh, it's a lot harder to pay vendors when that we don't have the money. Um, yeah. So we hope to sell the tickets beforehand, but, you know, I understand, and you know, I'm like like most people. Most people don't buy their tickets to events until usually a couple weeks before the event. So, um, we just gotta hope that you know, in those in those weeks coming up to the event, that people get pumped up, they get hyped up, and they're they're ready to go. And they buy tickets. That's, yeah, that that's that's true. And a lot of conventions um don't like doing the at the door deal, at the door sales anymore because of that. Um, now, as far as um. You know, you, you were saying your vendors. What, who's what kind of vendor hall or what kind of exhibit hall are you? Do you guys have um, at your sure. event? So um, there's a couple that I can't yet announce because we're still finalizing the deal. But um, or how about how about this actually? How do people go about contacting you for uh, a space in your in your your exhibit or vendor hall? Sure. If you go to gamerx.com, we actually have a contact us form, and you can. Um, learn about you know getting either a space in the vendor hall or on the indie table side. Uh, the indie table side, you know, you can get a half table to a full table starting at like 149. It's really cheap. Just you know, if, if you are an indie developer, you just want to show off your game, 149 bucks for your ticket and a table, you're, you're all set. If you're a bigger company, you want to have a booth in the expo hall, you can do that as well. Um, we have some really awesome sponsors this year. You know, we have Ouya is going to have a booth, uh, EFF, Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, we're going to have, you know, uh, companies like NIS America and Ubisoft and EA and uh, BioWare and all those companies, they're going to be involved in some way, whether it be a booth or ta uh, table or, you know, panels. Um, IndieCade is actually going to be uh, bringing up about 20, 15 to 20 uh, games that they're going to be curating. Uh, Cards Against Humanity is actually uh, sponsoring that uh, event, so uh, Cards Against Humanity is going to be involved. Uh, and so that's been really, really cool, you know, that there's there's been a lot of... Companies that you know, Cards and Humanity is a card-based game. Indicate is a, you know, an indie game convention. Uh, Ubisoft and, and Ouya are, are, you know, a hardware developer, AAA software publisher. We're kind of getting support across the board, uh, which is great. And I think we, you know, we just need want to continue doing that. Um, like this week, we're meeting with like Razer. And we're meeting with Alienware. So we're just kind of you know meeting with all these different companies and trying to get them to understand that you know the queer geek population is is huge. And that by supporting them and by, you know, even just throwing a little bit of money or product at it, it means that the world to these people to know that they're being supported by these companies. Definitely. It's very cool. I, I did not realize you had that much support already, that industry support from from everyone. That, that's really kind of cool, um, especially for an event it, it, that's going on its second year. That That's kind of amazing, actually. <laughs> Yeah, it's been, uh, I mean, it's definitely been tough, and it's been a lot of work, but, you know, a lot of people 
if, if, this, if Gamer X did poorly, I think it would be a poor reflection on the entire queer gaming movement. And, um, you know, without tooting our own horn too much, I, I think that we currently have the ball and we're, we're, we have the opportunity to show the gaming community what we're all about, what queer gaming community is all about. And I think it's important that we, we do our, we, you know, we work our butts off to make sure this event is successful and is great and is educational and informative and everyone has fun and people walk away that much more energized knowing that, you know, it doesn't matter who you are, you can make it in the gaming industry or you can be a gamer of any color, shape, size, or creed and, and be uh, respected for who you are. That's very cool. Okay, so let's let's jump to the future. Let's jump to August. Your event sold out. You guys maxed out at capacity. What's next? Where are you guys going to go from there? Well, so you know, we don't yet know what the plan is beyond GamerX two. I think that you know, right now we're really just trying to look at GamerX two, see what happens, and then you know, plan from there. Um, but you know, we also have other projects that we're currently working on. We have a you know, Read Only Memories, which is a cyberpunk game, it's currently on Steam Greenlight. It'll be out on Ouya, PC, and Mac in the fall, um, and that's something that you know we're really excited about. As well as we're helping to distribute a film called Gaming in Color, which is a documentary about queer gaming, and also features Gamer X uh, as well. So um, we're, we're going to be working on helping to get those you know those things distributed, um, and then once Gamer X is over, we're going to find out you know how did it go, what the, where the demand is, and then see you know what's next. Do we want to do Gamer X three? We want to start looking at doing events outside of San Francisco. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of questions that that I need to really kind of speak with the community and figure out what they want, um, because you know this is a lot of work and a lot of energy, and I don't want to spend that time and energy doing something that, that the community doesn't want. So I want to really kind of get get you know the voice and um, you know uh, 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 feedback from. Uh, people in the community, and then and then kind of make our next move based off that. Okay. So, uh, is GamerX on Facebook and in Twitter and that kind of thing? Are you guys utilizing social media at all for for? Yeah. The other reason the other reason that I ask is I just realized that I hadn't actually looked, which is bad on my part because I usually do um, just to yeah. add all the links and stuff to this later. So, yeah. Um, so, um, you know, we're uh, if you go on Facebook, just look for. GamerX on Facebook, look for GamerX on Google Plus or Twitter. We're on all those. Um, the company's name is, is Midboss, uh, so you can find us on Twitter at we, at we are Midboss or Midboss Games on Facebook. Uh, Read Only Memories is Read Only Memories on Facebook. Um, our biggest group, our biggest page is really oddly our Midboss um, Google Plus page where we have 580,000 followers. Um, which is really bizarre because all of our other things are under 10,000. Uh, but apparently, somehow, we got really popular on Google+. Plus, So that's our big one. Uh, we never really use it. But... That's weird because everyone... I use Google+, Plus for this. <laughs> yeah. This, this is the extent of my Google+. Plusing. But, I mean, it's cool. I mean, the thing is, if you if you Google, you know, mid-boss games or mid-boss, you'd be like, oh, so it's in the little knowledge graph on the right. It's like 500,000 people follow this, and it's like, that's cool. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of impressive. Uh, I don't really know how that happens, but it happens. So that's cool. That's cool. Um, so if, if you send me, if email me all these links to all the different sites where people can get in touch with you guys or find out more, and I'll link them to the video at the end. There will be links, guys. I've been doing that lately. It's something that I'm actively doing. Cool. So, um, so it looks like we're coming up just shy of 40 minutes on this. Um, so do, um, you guys had any final thoughts, anything you want to want to share or, or kind of go over? You know, I, th I think the biggest thing, you know, that I want to say, especially to, you know, a, kind of a wider audience is that, you know, GamerX is not for, just for LGBT people. It is much like, a, you know, an LGBT film festival or, or something like that where it's for everyone. It's for people who enjoy game, gaming. And gaming is the number one reason why even people are there. It's game rooms panels about gaming, it's all gaming, but with a focus on providing a safe space for LGBT folks, as well as panels that kind of focus, some panels focusing on LGBT and rights-based things, but at the end of the day, it's a gaming convention, and if, you want, if you're into games, and you live in the Bay Area, there's no reason why you shouldn't come out, because it is 
you know, whether you're a straight white dude or you are a trans woman or wherever you are, uh, we, we want to make a safe space for everyone where you can celebrate being a game. I'm sorry, a, a gamer and a geek and someone who supports um, a diverse community. In games. Definitely. So, guys, you know, I'm always talking about community, and this is why I started this. Uh, was was I, I formatted my channel because I realized that so many people focus on things that are just kind of forgive the term masturbatory in nature, where they're just talking about what they're doing or, or their own projects and stuff. That I always I realized that locally in Southern California and California as a whole, we don't cover, we don't support our our local events enough, guys. Uh, you know, in Orange County, we have this thing where there's so much to do, so many things going on that, that people don't attend local conventions. And San Francisco is not that far, guys. It's a six-hour drive, uh, like a one-hour flight if you jump in a plane. And supporting an event like this is, is beneficial to everyone. It helps grow the community. It helps develop and mature the community. It shows the community that, you know, it shows people that the community can be mature. And it's not just about a bunch of sweaty guys in rooms or on headsets playing games. Um, you know, it's it's definitely something that you should think about participating in or at least supporting in some fashion. Yeah. So, <laughs> but definitely, guys, I'm gonna put the links up. You guys definitely need to check this event out. This is, you know, I know typically I just cover the tabletop stuff, but this event is is all inclusive. It it definitely it it reaches a broader audience than what you know than what the normal events cover, and it's an outreach program. It's and it's second year and you guys should definitely think about supporting it so happy gaming may the dice always roll in your favor yeah and the queers love we love tabletop gaming we're, we're, we're some of the hard, most hardcore tabletop gamers in the world so if you want a good you know Catan match or a good match of the gathering match or, or I don't even know what else ticket to ride we're, we're ready for you <laughs> there you go guys something for everybody 